Today in the Daily Dose, HIV AIDS. One of the reasons that we're here today is because HIV and AIDS have ravaged the community. That too many people have gotten sick, too many children have gotten sick. So one of the things that we're here in front of this band to do today is my wife and I are going to get tested for HIV AIDS. Because if you know your status, then you can prevent illness. You can prevent passing it to your children and to your families. And we can make everybody have healthier, happier lives. So I just want everybody to remember that if a U.S. Senator from the United States can get tested and his wife can get tested, then everybody in this crowd can get tested. Medical news of potentially fatal disease unknown just months ago is spreading so quickly that doctors now say it's a national epidemic. Tonight, George Strait has a Medical Watch report on this mysterious disease and what's being done to fight it. For the last year, Phil Lanzarata has been fighting for his life. A new and mysterious disease has virtually destroyed his body's natural defenses, his immune system, leaving him vulnerable to a bizarre assortment of rare and potentially deadly disorders which in the last 12 months has hospitalized him 15 times. The effect has been one of uh, being you know, very weak and tired. Phil Lanzarata's problem is called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. Unknown 18 months ago, it has already claimed 636 victims, killing 261. 90% of the cases have turned up in New York and six other cities. But recently, AIDS has appeared in 29 states. It is spreading at an alarming rate. HIV AIDS has puzzled modern science since its explosive arrival in the early 1980s, spawning fierce debates regarding its origin, spread, and tenacious adaptability. Not only is HIV AIDS the newest unseen enemy opposing mankind, AIDS is a retelling of our deepest fears, prejudices, and the uniquely human desire to conquer the unknown. The latest government figures now show nearly 7,000 known cases of AIDS in this country, and almost half of those who've contracted AIDS already have died from it. Having followed many of the individual cases, the Center for Disease Control also reports that the number of people with the disease is doubling every six months. In fact, bathhouses nationwide are closing down. In San Francisco, the city has ordered them closed. President Reagan said today that Rock Hudson would always be remembered for his humanity. And on hearing of his death, the House of Representatives agreed to double the amount of aid funds for research next year. There will now be $190 million. There is, for a change, some encouraging news about AIDS. Word of a new treatment, and we emphasize treatment, with a new drug called AZT. When word got out today, AIDS hotlines across the country lit up. The World Health Organization reports today that the number of AIDS cases in the world jumped by 56% last year. More than 73,000 cases of AIDS have now been reported worldwide. On the first day of school today, more than 150 mentally handicapped students arrive for class at Tampa's Manhattan Exceptional Center. But seven-year-old Eliana Martinez, who is also handicapped and has AIDS, had to stay home with her private tutor. The reason Eliana isn't in school today is that a federal judge rule, the only way she could attend class would be to sit inside this 8 by 10 foot glass enclosure in the back of the room, isolated from the other students. Conference delegates demonstrated their anger today, protesting the jailing of their Dutch colleague, Hans Verhoof, who has become a symbol of what the conference is about. If we want to promote international solutions to the AIDS epidemic, which is what is needed, we can't do that by putting people in jail. Verhoof was detained and jailed in Minnesota after immigration officials found he was carrying medicine indicating he had AIDS. He was diagnosed with AIDS five years ago when he was 13 one of the first children known to have AIDS at that time. He spent the rest of his life fighting two invisible but powerful enemies, the virus inside him and the infectious fear and ignorance that surrounded him. Parents in Ryan's hometown of Russiaville, Indiana, tried to keep Ryan out of school. The courts ordered him admitted, but he had to use a separate bathroom, eat his lunch alone. There was a lot of people who thought that if you breathe the same air, you could get AIDS. 18-year-old Ryan White, who struggled five and a half years to overcome AIDS and prejudice, died early this morning of complications resulting from the disease. 
in Sarasota, Florida today, a funeral for Ricky Ray. He's the 15-year-old boy whose family was burned out of its home in Arcadia, Florida, five years ago, after it was learned that Ricky and his brothers had tested positive for the AIDS virus. Expressions of sympathy today for Olympic diver Greg Luganis, who has disclosed that he has AIDS. But there is controversy, too, about whether Luganis should have disclosed he was HIV positive before the Olympic Games in South Korea. Good evening. We begin tonight with America and AIDS. The return of Magic Johnson to professional basketball this week has certainly pushed AIDS up on the agenda again. Ritonavir is the most effective drug in a new class of AIDS drugs called protease inhibitors. These drugs attacked a critical uh, enzyme for HIV called protease. And without this enzyme, the virus is dead. When combined with other drugs such as AZT, protease inhibitors are effective in treating AIDS patients who have become resistant to all other therapies. The new drugs work best if given during the early weeks of the infection, when the virus begins to overwhelm a person's immune system. It's exciting to know that I may not be going to die from this, you know, so. The therapy can cost $15,000 a year. That puts the drugs well beyond the reach of people in developing countries where 80% of AIDS cases exist. At the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, researchers were optimistic science could stop it. We all thought that this was something that was going to go away very quickly. In 1984, the headlines made it seem so. U.S. health officials were confident an AIDS vaccine was on the way. We hope to have such a vaccine ready for testing in approximately two years. Not by a long shot. 17 years later, still no vaccine. Harriet Robinson has worked for nearly 10 years on an AIDS vaccine. The virus, she found, is incredibly stubborn, aggressive, and sneaky. So strains of the virus that appear in Russia, for instance, are different from those seen in Africa, which are different from the virus in the United States. Activists and top officials are again calling for cheap, life-saving drugs to be made available in poor countries. Two decades after the epidemic began, 40 million people worldwide are living with HIV AIDS, and more than half of those infected live in Africa. For African Americans who represent 12 percent of the U.S. population, the crisis is acute. In the year 2000, African Americans accounted for 47 percent of newly reported AIDS cases and more than half of new HIV infections. In the nation's capital, one out of 20 people is HIV positive. In the District of Columbia, which is 60 percent black, the AIDS rate is as high as Nigeria, Uganda, or Angola. For African Americans between the ages of 25 and 44, AIDS is the number one killer. When a person is first infected with human immunodeficiency virus, they generally experience mild flu-like symptoms approximately two to four weeks after infection. Patients then experience a clinical latency or dormancy period, remaining largely asymptomatic for upwards of 10 years or more. Once a patient reaches late-stage HIV infection, they frequently experience rapid weight loss, a dry cough, and profuse night sweats. Many late-stage patients also experience blurred vision, unusual lesions in the mouth and throat, pneumonia, memory loss, and depression. The final stage is AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. AIDS patients suffer from a myriad of opportunistic pathogens, including bacterial, protozoal, fungal, and viral infections as well as HIV-associated malignancies such as Kaposi's sarcoma. After more than 30 years of study, researchers now know that hints of the impending epidemic began to surface long before the 1980s. In 1959, preserved blood samples reveal the first known case of HIV in a human, taken from a person who died in the Belgian Congo. Also that same year, a 49-year-old American shipping clerk dies of pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, a disease we now know to be closely associated with AIDS. After performing a post-mortem autopsy, Dr. Gordon Henniger found the case so beguiling that he pickled the man's lungs for future re-examination. 
In 1966, researchers believed that a man working in the Congo first introduced HIV into the Americas when he returned to his native homeland of Haiti. Two years later, several well-documented studies indicate that the HIV virus first arrived in the United States, only to remain unrecognized for an additional 12 years. In 1969, a St. Louis teenager dies of an illness that baffles a team of medical experts. Eighteen years later, molecular biologists at Tulane University test samples from the teen's remains and confirm the presence of HIV. In 1975, reports of an unknown illness causing severe physical wasting is first reported in Africa. The disease is later determined to be AIDS. A year after that, Norwegian sailor Arvid Noe dies of AIDS-related symptoms. It is later found that he contracted HIV-AIDS in Africa during the early 1960s. In 1977, a San Francisco prostitute gives birth to the first of three children who would later be diagnosed with AIDS. The following year, a Portuguese man dies of AIDS-related symptoms he would later be confirmed as the first known infection of HIV-2. In April of 1980, San Francisco resident Ken Horn becomes the first AIDS case in the United States. His condition is reported to the CDC with Kaposi's sarcoma and fungal cryptococcus. In October of that same year, French-Canadian flight attendant Gaetan Dugas pays his first known visit to a gay New York City bathhouse. He would later be deemed patient zero for his apparent connection to many early cases of AIDS in the United States. By his death four years later, the CDC had linked him directly or indirectly to 40 of the first 248 reported cases of AIDS in the United States. Scientists and medical experts begin to understand that they are dealing with something new and potentially catastrophic. The condition becomes known as gay-related immune deficiency. We now know that HIV is a lentivirus, which in turn is part of a larger group of viruses known as retroviruses. HIV-1 has four subgroups known as M, N, O, and P followed by a second variant known as HIV-2, which to date has two epidemic subcategories, A and B. Lentiviruses can be found in a number of different animal species. However, the most intriguing lentivirus in terms of HIV origination is the simian immunodeficiency virus. Following a 10-year study surrounding the origins of HIV-1, in February of 1999, researchers Paul Sharp of Nottingham University and Beatrice Hahn of the University of Alabama announced that they had found a type of SIV affecting common chimpanzees of the species Pan troglodytes. Their findings were published two years later in Nature magazine, wherein they concluded that wild chimps had been infected simultaneously with two different simian immunodeficiency viruses, which in turn committed viral sex to form a third virus, which passed to humans in the form of HIV-1. The most commonly accepted theory regarding the transmission origins of HIV-AIDS is the hunter theory. Even to this day, bushmeat hunting remains a steady behavior in the African subcontinent, despite ardent calls to end the practice due to high animal extinction rates and zoonotic disease transmission. As a result, the hunter theory postulates that simian immunodeficiency virus made a blood-to-blood -blood transfer when humans butchered chimpanzees for food. Another theory set forth by journalist Edward Hooper in his book The River suggests that HIV can be traced to the testing of an oral polio vaccine called CHAT, given to over a million people in the Belgian Congo, Rwanda, and Yurundi in the late 1950s. It may also be a coincidence that AIDS first appeared in Africa at the same time that the World Health Organization was eradicating smallpox. 
During the 1970s, members of the World Health Organization were vaccinating people in Central Africa with a live smallpox vaccine. Reusing needles 40 to 60 times without re-sterilization between patients. It is theorized that since live vaccines directly provoke the human immune system, HIV was awakened in humans from an otherwise dormant state. Another recent hypothesis is the colonialist or heart of darkness theory. Based in part on the hunter premise of viral transmission, the heart of darkness theory was first proposed in 2000 by Jim Moore, an American specialist in primate behavior who published his findings in the Journal of AIDS Research and Human Retroviruses. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, in areas such as French Equatorial Africa and the Belgian Congo, colonialist rule was particularly harsh, forcing many African men to live in labor camps where food and proper sanitation were scarce. Combined with physical exhaustion brought on by near slave labor conditions, these factors may have set the stage for compromised immune systems and susceptibility to opportunistic pathogens such as HIV. Add to the mix a serendipitous meal of stray SIV positive chimpanzee and the transmission vector was complete. Recalling the rash of anti-Semitism witnessed in Europe during the Black Death, Conspiracy theories and prejudice have followed the HIV-AIDS crisis since the early days of 1981. As recently as 2005, in a survey conducted by the RAND Corporation and Oregon State University, pollsters discovered that more than 25% of African Americans believed that AIDS was produced and disseminated from government laboratories as a form of genocide against black Americans. Along the same lines, when medical journals and scientific publications in the early 1980s began to point a collective finger at Haiti as the origination point of HIV into the Americas, Haitian immigrants bore the sting of discrimination and stigma that had previously been reserved for gay men. As a result, a large number of Haitians living in the U.S. lost their jobs and found themselves evicted from their homes. Based on shaky scientific evidence and apparent prejudices within many parts of the medical community, Haitians were added to the list of homosexuals, hemophiliacs, and heroin users to make up the 4-H club of AIDS-related social outcasts. Given the substantial pool of evidence linking the HIV virus to 1930s Africa, researchers then set out to isolate the factors that caused the disease to spread so rapidly in the early 1980s. While ease of international travel and homosexual promiscuity played a key role in HIV transmission, researchers also point to the blood industry and illegal intravenous drug abuse. As blood transfusions became increasingly routine in modern medicine, cash-strapped individuals, including IV drug users, were paid handsomely whenever they donated blood. In the early stages of the AIDS epidemic, doctors were unaware of how easily HIV could be spread by unscreened blood donations. As a result, nearly everyone who received HIV-infected blood went on to become HIV-positive. After listening to a talk by biologist and Nobel laureate David Baltimore, biomedical researcher Robert Charles Gallo made the study of retroviruses his life's work. In 1976, Gallo led a team of researchers who first isolated and identified a new T-cell growth factor known as interleukin-2. Their breakthrough allowed researchers to grow T-cells in the laboratory and study the viruses that affect them. In 1982, Gallo received the prestigious Lasker Award for his pioneering discovery of the first human RNA tumor virus and its association with certain leukemias and lymphomas. Published in Science Magazine in 1983, a French research team led by Luc Montagnier from the Pasteur Institute published an article describing a retrovirus they called lymphadenopathy-associated virus 
which had been isolated from a patient at risk from AIDS. A year and a half later, Gallo and his collaborators published four papers demonstrating that a retrovirus was the cause of AIDS. The controversy regarding which group would ultimately earn credit for the discovery was later highlighted in the 1993 television docudrama and the band played on. In 2008, French researchers Luc Montagnier, Francois Barcenozzi, and Harold Zurhausen were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, with no mention of Gallo and his team's substantial contributions linking retroviruses to AIDS. Undaunted by the squabble over who first revealed the retrovirus AIDS connection, in 1995, Gallo went on to discover that chemokines, a class of naturally occurring compounds, could block the HIV virus and halt the progression of AIDS. His discovery led to a class of drugs used for the treatment of HIV, including chemokine antagonists and entry inhibitors. In the early 1980s, AIDS patients rarely live longer than a few years. Thanks to the selfless work of researchers such as Gallo and Montagnier, today HIV-positive patients routinely live long and healthy lives. HIV-AIDS has led to the deaths of more than 30 million people since it was first recognized in 1981, placing HIV-AIDS in league with some of the top unseen enemies in human history. In 2010, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV-AIDS estimates that worldwide over 33 million adults are living with HIV-AIDS, with an additional 2.5 million children living with the same disease. It is further estimated that AIDS has left over 16 million orphans due to the loss of both parents to AIDS. Of the nearly 36 million people living with HIV-AIDS, more than 23 million live in sub-Saharan Africa. And there you have it, HIV AIDS, today in The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose. And if you enjoyed today's episode, share the link with a friend or colleague so that they too can learn something new every day.